Good evening, folks. Ken Hoven here and the crew at Dinosaur Adventureland in Lenox, Alabama. We're going to be covering our seminar on the age of the earth. But first, I need to announce today is National Atheist Day. One atheist was complaining they didn't have a holiday. He said, you Christians have Easter and Christmas. And I said, you've got a holiday. It's April Fool's Day. The Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there's no God. And you are a fool if you believe there is no God. It's just that simple. Anyway, we'll see Judgment Day. Okay, in the last session, we talked about some of the scientific ways to show how the Earth cannot, uh, the, the universe cannot be billions of years old. Evidence from space. Now we're going to zoom into the Earth. What does the Earth tell us about its age? How old is the Earth? Well, I mentioned if you find a box full of coins in a tr sunken treasure ship, you don't find the oldest date in the coin, you find the youngest date, and that becomes what's known as the limiting factor. This boat had to sink after 1750. So if I asked you, when did the boat sink? You wouldn't look at the oldest coin. The youngest coin becomes the limiting factor. Oldest coins don't matter. There may be a few scientific ways to, to indicate, hey, this earth might be billions of years old. But if one of them, one, proves it's not right, then the youngest one takes the, you know how it is, Paul, in a court of law, you say, look, we saw a guy six foot one running from the scene. He had blood on his right pant leg, and they go through all the evidence, and we think Mr. Jones did it. Mr. Jones says, I wasn't in the country on that date. Oh, okay, case closed. One piece of evidence can be exonerating. One. One proof of a young earth can exonerate the creation story and completely destroy the evolution story. Now, I am fully aware that time is the pacifier for the evolutionist. Time can solve things nothing else can solve. And if you take away their pacifier, they get frantic. Guy called me today about, you know, uh, he said, about, why don't you believe in evolution? He said, why don't you accept evolution? I said, well, first I would object to using the word accept. You can only accept something that is, you know, true. Nobody's ever seen any animal produce a different kind. He said, yeah, but what if you gave them millions of years? I said, there's your problem right there. You're counting on time to accomplish something that nobody's ever observed. I said, you know, if we drop something and it falls, we can demonstrate over and over gravity works. But I believe if we wait long enough over millions of years, maybe it'll fall up. <laughs> I don't think so. Okay, no. How many have ever played the game Clue? Tonight we're going to play Clue. How old is the Earth? Let's look at some of the clues. The Bible says, speak to the earth and it shall teach thee. Well, how old is this place? I googled it today. How old is the earth? 4.543 billion years old and 26 minutes. Okay. How old is the earth? Well, let's look at a few clues. The earth has a magnetic field, right? So I compass this point north. The earth's magnetic field is getting weaker. Some of the atheists complained some of my slides were from 30 years ago. Well, yeah, truth doesn't change. You know, 2 plus 2 was 4 thousands of years ago, and it's still 4. Yeah, truth doesn't change. Earth's magnetic field is getting weaker. I think everybody agrees with that. It cannot be more than less, less than, it has to be less than 25,000 years old. Carbon dating cannot work because as the magnetic field decays, more radiation gets in. The carbon-14 content of the plants, and therefore the animals, is constantly changing based upon the changing magnetic field. National Pornographic. A geographic. Earth's magnetic field is fading. Yeah, really, I would agree. Computer models indicate the strength of Earth's magnetic field declined about 10% over the last century. Earth's magnetic field is constantly changing, and the way which it changes also changes. Hmm. During the next 150,000 years, it rose to a maximum strength and then began to decline. Notice also how fast the magnetic field recovers after it reaches zero. In some cases, much less than 10,000 years. Presently, Earth's magnetic field is weakening in strength by 5% every 100 years. Accessed today. Hold on a minute. Earth's magnetic field is getting weaker. Earth's magnetic field is fading from National Pornographic today. They, everybody knows the magnetic field is getting weaker. Today it's about 10% weaker than when the German mathematician Gauss started keeping tabs on it in 1845. Hmm. The declining magnetic field from NASA Science Center. Earth's magnetic field is weakening 10 times faster. I don't think you're going to find anybody's going to argue about it 
the magnetic field is getting weaker. Earth's magnetic field is weakening 10 times faster than they thought. Hmm. Earth's magnetic field is not about to flip. They're going to tell the kids the Earth's magnetic field gets weaker and then it reverses. This is absolute baloney. It's a lie. It does not happen. The textbooks are going to say there are magnetic reversals, reversed polarity. This is what they're going to teach the kids. This is not true, kid. This, they're lying to you. Okay? There are areas of stronger and weaker magnetism. As you go out from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, you'll find areas of stronger and weaker and stronger and weaker magnetism. And there's a simple reason for that, which we cover on video number six of our series, which is here somewhere, the Creation Seminar series, about the crust of the earth, the ma mantle of the earth, the crust of the earth when it broke up during Noah's flood, the basalt underneath would bulge up into the hole, cracking the basalt. Water would rush into the cracks, cooling it down. Hot rock will not store a magnetic field. Cold rock will. So what they were measuring was the crack. They were finding the cracks, which are filled in with sediments. By finding stronger and weaker magnetism, they were simply finding where the cracks are in the basalt underneath. It has nothing to do with the reversed magnetic field. There are no magnetic reversals on the ocean floor. None. Only areas of stronger and weaker magnetism. So what they did, somebody drew a line through the middle of this sine wave and said, oh, everything down here is reversed. No, the line should go down here. Just because if I lined up everybody in the world and found the average height was five foot seven, does that mean anybody less than five foot seven is reversed and down in the ground? No, they're just less than average, right? So this, what they found were stronger and weaker. There's a good article about it on Walt Brown's website. Walt Brown uh, taught physics at the Air Force Academy for years, full colonel in the Air Force, thank you, man, uh, has a great website. His book we sell, In the Beginning, is phenomenal. If you want to go down deep, stay down long, come up dry, you can read that book, In the Beginning, by Walt Brown. How was it, 30 bucks on our website, Dr. Dino? 35, it's huge. It's out of print now. But there's more coming in a few, in a month. His wife called me a month ago and said, he's redoing it, ninth edition. Wow. He's got, the guy's got to be 80 years old, you know, he's just an absolute genius. Now, they're going to tell you this is part of the Pangea theory. How many have ever heard of Pangea before when you went to school? They say, oh, boys and girls, all the continents used to fit together like a puzzle. Oh, really? Pangea, a supercontinent, existed in the late Paleozoic and early Mesozoic eras. It assembled from earlier continental units 335 million years ago and began to break apart 175 million years ago. Really? That's what they tell you in school. What they don't tell you is Africa was shrunk 35 to 40 percent to make them fit. Mexico and Central America are gone. ¿Qué pasa, señor? ¿Dónde está México, Panamá, Costa Rica, Guatemala? ¿Qué pasa? What happened? Where did these con where Where's Mexico? You just took it out to make them fit. I think the Mexicans might get upset about that. Yeah. <laughs> Africa is actually nearly twice as big as South America, if you look at it. Africa is 11.6 million square miles. South America is 6.8. Don't they look about the same size on the drawing? Mm -hmm. They shrank Africa 35% to make them fit. You also should notice, if you take the water out of the oceans, you, you might notice there is, there is dirt underneath. Oh, wow. A lot of dirt. Oh, yeah. People say, Hovind, do you think the continents were ever connected? I say, they are still connected right now. <laughs> Aren't they? Mm -hmm. If you had a long pair of tails, so you could walk across the ocean. What do you mean, were they connected? They're still connected. Duh. <laughs> Dumb theory. This whole Pangea thing is so stupid. We cover much more on that in video number six. But... The Earth is spinning about 1,000 miles an hour at the equator, 1,038.6 for you technical folks, depending on your, upon your altitude, and on the, actually on the tide, because as the tidal crust goes up and down a few inches. Who cares? Never mind. A little over 1,000 miles an hour. We're going 886 miles an hour right here in Lenox. Everything is moving fast, except for Rich's dog. But, uh, so, the Earth, and Lady Di, the Earth is spinning 1,000 miles an hour. Want to hold it. The change in Earth's rotational period was first measured using eclipses of all things. They noticed the length of eclipses is, getting, is changing. So many centuries ago, they studied the Moon and said, wow, the Moon is accelerating in its orbit. What was actually happening was the Earth's rotation was slowing down. First noticed in 1695. 
Earth's rotation is slowing down with time. Thus, a day was shorter in the past. This is due to tidal effects of the, the Moon has on Earth's rotation. Atomic clocks show that modern day is about 1.7 milliseconds more than a century ago, slowly increasing. Hmm. Interesting. In 1990, they said add a tick to the clock because the Earth is slowing down and the clocks are off by a second. They kind of said regular clocks use days as a measure, which are growing longer by a thousandth of a second or more daily as Earth's rotation slows. Earth's rotation is slowing down. To compensate, we're going to have a leap second. Most people have heard of leap year, but many people have never heard of leap second. Do you know we have a leap second about every year to year and a half? Because the Earth is slowing down. Here's when they added leap seconds. The last one was done uh, near the end of 2017. Probably be, be another one this year. A leap second is a one second adjustment that is occasionally applied to coordinated universal time. In order to keep it in time, its time of the day close to the mean solar time. Without such a correction, time reckoned by Earth's rotation drifts away from atomic time. So in 1972, since 1972, they've had 27 leap seconds. Well, now hold it. The Earth is spinning. That's what causes the Coriolis effect. Because of the different speeds and different latitudes, there's several factors involved there. But the Coriolis effect is caused by one of the things is the Earth's rotation going around, spinning around spinning a thousand miles an hour. Different, different latitudes, different speeds. We're going 80, 886 here in Lenox. Actually, we're a mile north of Lenox, so you know, a little bit more than that. Who cares? Doesn't matter. But they want me to tell, if the Earth is slowing down, this is going to be complicated, okay? The Earth is slowing down. So that means that it used to be going faster. How many can figure that out with no help? Three, four, five, six, ten, okay. Well, if you go back a few million years, the Earth was going a lot faster. So I know what happened to the dinosaurs. They got flung off like our Flingosaurus dinosaur. So the Earth, just the spin of the Earth slowing down ought to raise some serious questions. How did it get spinning to begin with? Where did this energy come from? What would it take to get the Earth spinning a thousand miles an hour? How much gas would that take? How much energy would that take? It can't be billions of years old. It should have stopped by now. Sahara Desert has what's called a prevailing wind pattern. As the wind blows the same direction, the hot air comes off the desert, kills the stuff next door, and that becomes a desert also. The process is called desertification. Deserts grow. They take over good land and destroy it. The Sahel is south of the Sahara. It is growing rapidly four miles a year and killing all the critters. They're just, it's drying up. These areas here, desertification vulnerability, just accessed yesterday. Well, even parts out west of the United States are subject to desertification. Sahara Desert is growing about four miles a year, but it's only 1,300 miles north to south. Potsdam Institute said Sahara Desert is probably about 4,000 years old. This one says about 6,000 years ago, Sahara Desert was tropical. What happened? Sahara Desert used to be green and lush. Then humans showed up. Oh, blame it on the humans. Okay. Today, Sahara Desert is defined by undulating sand dunes, unforgiving sun, and oppressive heat. But just 10,000 years ago, it was lush and verdant, meaning green. So what spurred the shift from woodland to wasteland? Is Sahara Desert growing or shrinking? Nearly a century of data shows the enormous Sahara Desert is growing. In fact, it's currently 10% larger than it was a century ago. Oh. Sahara Desert is growing. Here's what it means. Well, now hold it. If Sahara Desert is growing, that means it used to be smaller. So why isn't the Sahara Desert bigger by now? Why is it only 4,000 years old? Hey, come in, guys. Have a seat. Good to see you back here. I have a theory about that. You see, about 6,000 years ago, God made everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. It's pretty hard to have a desert under a flood. Right? So the desert couldn't start growing until the floodwaters went down. So I predict, based on the Bible, Sahara Desert will be less than 4,400 years old. It is. Maybe the Bible's right. Did you know when they drill down into the ground, sometimes they hit oil? I lived in East Texas. You guys are from Texas. Your brothers are, right? Okay. What part of Texas? South Texas. South Texas. I was in Longview, okay? Okay. Where they have actually green stuff growing. 
West Texas doesn't have none of that. I lived in our county, Gregg County, the smallest county in Texas, had 20,000 oil wells in one county. Wow. Kilgore Oil Museum was there, you know, and we used to go take people there all the time. When they drill down into the ground, they get incredible pressure. The oil will come squirting up into the, uh, out of the ground. The greatest pressure I've heard that they ever encountered was 20,000 pounds per square inch. Put that in your bike tire and watch what happens. Now, they've said that rock on top, the pressure in the oil wells is greater than the weight of overbearing rock. So where did this pressure come from? They say it can only hold that excess pressure for 10,000 years. It should have, should have cracked the rock and leaked out like a frack job. High pressure temperature wells. High pressure wells start at around 10,000 PSI. Wow. Operator in the Gulf of Mexico had a deep water project 138 miles south of Louisiana in 2,100 feet of water. The gas and compensate production came from sands located at depths 19,000 feet. The high pressure was greater than 15,000 PSI. Textbook says, oil and gas are formed from organisms that once lived in the sea and are changed by heat and pressure into oil. Okay, well then I have a question. If the pressure is greater than the weight of overbearing rock, why hasn't it cracked and leaked the pressure off back down to normal pressure by now? Can that last for millions of years? Converting organic waste to oil. Oil can be made in 20 minutes. This is back in 1971. They knew how to take organic material and make oil. In Australia, there's a factory in 1996, uh, started making oil from sewage sludge in 30 minutes. In Texas, they said they took a factory next to a place where they slaughter turkeys, took the turkey guts, the head, the feathers, the beaks, the guts nobody wanted, and squeezed it under pressure and turned it into oil in 30 minutes. Hmm. The thermal conversion process can take slaughterhouse waste, municipal sewage, old tires, mixed plastics, and make high quality oil. Interesting. British engineers create petrol from air and water. The methanol is then converted into petrol. By renew using renewable energy to power the process, it's possible to create carbon neutral fuel. This is accessed today. Huh. Algae to crude oil, million year natural process takes minutes in the laboratory. Northwest Pacific. Sinclair has the dinosaur as their logo. We got a couple dinosaur signs around here somewhere. Where's... I brought you that. Sinclair. I know, it's here, I, we've got to put it up somewhere. They say dinosaurs turned into oil. Yes, boys and girls, the dinosaurs are mellowed for 80 million years. Well, I got a question. Why is there still high pressure in oil wells? I have a theory about that. See, about 6,000 years ago, God made everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. In that flood, lots of stuff drowned and got covered up by the rocks and gravel and mud, and it got pretty heavy on top, and it squished them into oil in less than 20 minutes. So next time you're at the gas station and pumping them in there, that would include all the people that didn't get on the ark. Hmm, you can say, bye, Grandpa, why didn't you get on that ark? You should have listened to Noah. I was preaching in Denver, Colorado one time, and some guys came to the seminar, and they said, Now, Hoven, we know you teach the earth is only 6,000 years old. We'd like to prove to you that you're wrong. Come with us, please. I said, where are we going? They said, we're going to the Denver National Ice Core Laboratory. We are the guys who go to Iceland, or to Greenland, and to the South Pole, and drill holes in the ice. And we want to take you in the freezer. It's about the size of this building, and it's like 30 below zero in there. They took me into this freezer and showed me all the stuff that they do. They said, we drill with a core sample, like an apple core, you know, you drill down and pull the center out, drill it with a pipe down. We said, we, they said, we drill down with this coring machine and we pull up the ice cores and we have them here in the laboratory. They took me in and showed them to me, laying on the table. They said, you can see it has clear and then milky, clear, milky, clear, milky, there are ice rings. I said, yeah, I can see that very clearly, okay. They said, well, there are 10 ice core samples in this news article yanked from the Antarctic glacier waiting to be tested at the National Ice Core Laboratory. So they showed me these rings, dark light, dark light. And they said, Mr. Hovind, these are annual rings. In the summer, the snow melts a little bit and it refreezes and makes clear ice. But in the winter, the snow just packs deep, harder and harder, and it makes milky colored ice. Oh, in Greenland and Antarctica, where the weather is consistently dry and very cold, the glaciers are miles thick, but the annual rings are very thin. The deepest cores can measure over 10,000 feet. 
from Greenland and show the climate 135,000 years ago. So they're going to tell the kids in school, summer, winter, summer, winter are these rings. Uh, no, there's your problem right there. They show the pictures of the rings and say, see, these are annual rings, and they are not annual rings. In 1942, five or six American airplanes landed in Greenland, and they, the guys all escaped. They got off the continent and ended up going to fight the war, but the planes were all stuck on Greenland. They said, forget it, we'll build new airplanes. 1990, a rich guy from Kentucky got a brilliant idea. He said, let's go get those airplanes off the ice. Brand new World War II airplanes. When they went there to look for them, they had to use ground-penetrating radar because they were so deep down under the ice from snow. From 1942 to 1990, 48 years. They finally located the planes about three miles from where they landed because the glacier had moved down. You know, the whole thing is sliding. They melted a hole down to get to it. They went down 263 feet. Melted a four-foot hole down with what they call a gopher, a big thing that they kept pumping hot water through this, through pipes wrapped around this thing and just melted a hole down and pumped the water off the top. They took the airplane apart down there and brought the pieces up through the hole. For the big fuselage, they had to drill two holes and cut away the middle between them and brought the fuselage up between here. I, I talked to the guy who, who did it, Bob Carden. I went there. He was in Middleborough, Kentucky, where they put it back together. I said, Bob, I understand you dug the airplane out. He said, yes, I did. I was there for years digging on that airplane. I said, okay, the airplanes were in the ground for, two, for 48 years in the ice. They were 263 feet down. That's five and a half feet a year. Deepest hole they've ever drilled is 10,000 feet. That'd be 1,800 years worth of ice. Now, deeper ice is pressed. I understand the layers get thinner and thinner from pressure. It's called fern, F-I-R-N. So I can understand maybe three or 4,000 years. But why do they say 135,000? They're, I think, maybe ignorantly, but they're lying to the kids. I said, Bob, when I went there in 1999, I said, when you drilled down to get to the plane, did you go through ice rings? He said, yeah, many hundreds of them. I said, well, how can there be many hundreds of rings on top of these airplanes? Shouldn't there be like, you know, 48? How can you get hundreds of annual rings in 48 years? He said, who told you those are annual rings? That doesn't represent summer, winter, summer, winter. It represents warm, cold, warm, cold, warm, cold. You can get five of those in one week. Yeah. Can't you? Yeah. Warm day, cold night. I mean, hello. <laughs> Certainly get multiple rings in the year. But I just Googled it today. And they're still saying ice core basics. This 19 centimeter long ice core from 1855, or 1855 meter depth shows annual layers. Now look. I don't know who runs the internet on this site, but you need to get up to date. Those are not annual layers. If you're ignorant, I'll try to help you. See, ignorance can be fixed. Stupid is forever. That cannot be fixed, okay? But ignorance can be fixed. You're in trouble, are you? Me too, bro. This guy wrote to me from Alaska. He said, Brother Hovind, there are, I got 15 layers of snow on my car in eight hours. Not 15 inches, 15 layers. Eskimos have over 42 words for snow. What else is there to talk about? <laughs> There's icy snow, slippery snow, you know, easy to pack snow. Lots of different kinds of snow. So why are there only a few thousand years of ice rings at the poles? I have a theory about that. About 6,000 years ago, God made everything. And 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. Since the flood, the ice rings have slowly accumulated. And I would predict there would probably be less than, you know, a couple miles of snow at the North and South Pole. How many have ever heard of the geologic column? They tell the kids, oh yes, boys and girls, each of these layers is a different age. Did you know there are petrified trees found standing up, running through these layers, that they're telling you are millions of years different in age? Sometimes the petrified trees are upside down, standing up through the layers. That tree got confused for a long time, trying to find sunlight, keep growing, it's got to be down here somewhere. <laughs> There's a 30-foot petrified tree in a kettle mine in, Kentucky, in uh, Tennessee, the top and the bottom are in different coal seams. You can go all over northeast Tennessee, north, uh, yeah, northeast Tennessee. There are hundreds of petrified trees standing up, running out of the coal mine, in the coal mines. They find them all the time. Call uh, Richard Reeves, David Reeves Ministry uh, in uh, Cornersville, Tennessee, and see, he's been there many times. We've got pictures of him, but I'll cover that on video number four. Spirit Lake. 
blew over 20,000 trees that were blown down by the volcano into Spirit Lake. I talked to a guy uh, last week who was up there scuba diving. He said, Brother Hovind, the trees at the bottom of Spirit Lake are already petrified. Hmm. This happened in 1980. Uh, Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens. Did not, already petrified, already standing up, petrified, running through multiple, every, every seasonal change, every good storm, you get a new layer down there, washes more stuff off. You're going to get hundreds of layers in a few years in Spirit Lake. And it doesn't take long for things to petrify. Here's petrified firewood, chopped on before it got petrified. Here's a petrified pickle. A guy called me from Montana. He said, Brother Hovind, there's an old house out in the woods by my house. The roof's gone, the walls are falling out, but in the pantry there was a jar with a pickle in it. The lid to the jar rusted off and it evaporated and the pickle turned to stone. Would you like it for your museum? Wow. I said, of course. Who, who would not want a petrified pickle? <laughs> of course I want a petrified pickle. How about this one? One thing all types of fossilization share in common, accessed yesterday, curious meerkat from the United Kingdom, uh, they require the dead organism to be trapped underneath layers of sediment. Now, what would trap dead things under layers of sediment? Like a flood. What is, this is what makes fossilization such a rare event. How many animals died today? Millions. Millions, millions maybe billions, if you count the little bitty ones. How many are going to fossilize? None. They got to be buried. That's what they say here. Here's what it says. One thing all types of fossilization share in common is they require to be trapped underneath layers of sediment. This was what makes fossilization such a rare event. The question, are fossils rare? No. No, they're all over, trillions of them worldwide. They're not, fossils aren't rare. Fossilization is rare. If the organism is left exposed after death, it's usually destroyed by decay or scavengers. You know, the coyotes and buzzards drag it around. And has, before it has a chance to fossilize. But under the right conditions, fossilization, this is all British spelling, can occur relatively quickly in a ballpark of hundreds or thousands of years. The speed at which this occurs will also depend strongly on the size of the organism. Tiny organisms, eggs or embryos, can fossilize quite quickly, perhaps in a matter of weeks or months. Yes, sir. Uh, do you know if they've ever found any fossilized humans in like where Pompeii was at? I was in Pompeii in Italy, and they, they weren't fossilized, but they were covered in ash, and then the people rotted away, and there's a cavity there in the exact shape of the people. So when they began digging through the ash, they started pouring plaster of Paris in these holes, and then dig the ash away, and you have a cast of the person made out of plaster of Paris. It was hot. It was really hot, Pompeii. The, I, I, burnt them up, completely, dis bones and all. Yep. Eggs are particularly good for rapid natural fossilization, too. As many marine species, they show adaptations to slow the rate of decay. A good idea if your method of fossilization involves floating around in the sea for a period of time, which offers a larger window of opportunity. In the laboratory, paleontologists have been able to fossilize lobster and shrimp eggs in two to eight weeks. Now, kids? This. You, right. Why are they going to tell the kids in school it takes millions of years for things to fossilize? Mm -hmm. Researchers in Washington have developed a method that can speed up the process of wood petrification in the lab, producing chemically petrified wood in a matter of days. Here's a petrified fish giving birth. It does not take millions of years to give birth, praise God. Petrified cowboy boot with the cowboy's legs still in it. I used to have the jar, we just got the pickle now. David Crosby, there's his address, he sent it to me from Montana. The jar got all busted up, a kid was playing with it. I, I think I got a picture of that coming up here. They would how to fossilize the bottom half of your fence post. Wow. So you can put your fence posts in the ground and they'll be fossilized and the top is still wood to nail your fence to it. Wow. Yeah. Petrified peanuts, Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum in St. Augustine, Florida. Petrified charcoal briquettes. Petrified teddy bear. Here he is right here. Does not take millions of years. Um, that's that water, several waterfalls that do that. Splash the minerals all over it. Mississippi River is depositing sediments at the rate of 80,000 tons an hour. Whoa. Mississippi Delta has a profound effect on landforms in Louisiana. 
436,000 tons a day of mud come down the muddy Mississippi. 436,000 tons a day. Did, how close did you live, Tom, to the Mississippi? Oh, you were quite a ways, weren't you? Yeah, oh, 50 miles, okay. The mud washes out, and the delta is growing larger and larger and larger. How old is the Mississippi Delta? The modern-day Mississippi River Delta Plain began to evolve during the Holocene epoch, 7,500 to 8,000 years ago. Hold it. The delta is less than 8,000 years old? Here's from National Geographic. The Mississippi River Delta changes has changed over the last 6,000 years, depositing sediments, 16 distinct river deltas. How old is the Mississippi Delta? Mississippi Delta formed over 7,000 years ago. Now just hold on a minute. It's only 8,000 8, years worth of mud out there. I have a question. If the Earth is millions of years old, why isn't the whole Gulf of Mexico full of mud by now? Hmm. For this textbook says, this is from the flashcards the kids have to use for their test. For the past hundred million years, redeposited sediment has gradually increased the size of the Mississippi Delta. Somebody's either really stupid or they're lying trying to preserve their dumb theory. Because the Delta shows about 7,000 years. Why would they tell the kids millions? This is to keep the fairy tale alive. Why is there only a few thousand years worth of mud in the Delta? I have a theory about that. About 6,000 years ago, God made everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. As the flood water went down, the landforms formed, and then slowly the Delta rivers all started building their deltas. So I predict the Mississippi Delta will be certainly less than 30,000 years old, maybe less than 8,000 years old. See, when the water, when the mud first began, water first began running off, it washed half of that mud out there in the first 20 minutes. So today's rate cannot be used to calculate the age of the delta. Not if half the mud went out there because of a big flood. I talked to a pastor in Baker, Louisiana. He said, Brother Hope, when you did a seminar at, our, at Comite Baptist, which is one of my young couples attended, they told you a story of an experience I encountered while working in the oil field. We drilled through a tree over 60 feet almost 14,000 feet below the surface. He was in the oil field out there in the, in the Gulf of Mexico, drilling through the mud, and they hit a tree 14,000 feet down, and the tree was standing up 60 feet tall. How'd he get down there? That was his phone number. You can check out, it might still be for Dan. I was up in Alaska, went out to see the Portage Glacier. You gotta pay 12 bucks to take a cruise, little cruise line out and watch the glacier break off. And, I was standing on the deck next to a guy. I said, what do you do for a living? He said, I drill for oil on the North Slope. I said, you ever find anything unusual down there? He said, you would not believe the stuff we do. He said, a few months ago we were drilling through. We drilled through a thousand feet of permanently frozen ground, permafrost. And we, when we drill, we, we keep what comes out of the hole, lay it out so we can tell what we're going through, you know, what formation. We keep it laying out on shore. He said, we started hitting wood, a thousand feet below the surface. He said, we, we kept saving all the pieces. We drilled through a tree three, 300 feet tall, under a thousand feet of permafrost. First place, on the north slope of Alaska, there are no trees. There's one tree in Barrow, Alaska. It's in a Chinese restaurant. It's about this big around and this tall, and all winter long they keep lights on it to keep the dumb thing alive so they can say, we have a tree at our restaurant. The only tree in Barrow, Alaska inside a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> I went up there and preached 4,000 4, 4, people in the town. How do you get a tree? Three, there, first place, there are very few trees 300 feet tall in the world. Okay, that's a, that's a tall tree. There are none in Barrow, Alaska. Oldest tree in the world is a bristlecone pine. We have a log right here. This is a sample in our museum. You can come and see. This tree started growing in about the year 1300 in Colorado. <laughs> There are 700 rings in this bristlecone log. The trees they plant around here, these loblolly pine, grow extremely fast. This one's probably only about 15 years old, off that stump right in front of my office here. They plant the loblolly because they grow really fast. Well, the bristlecone grows really slow. Okay, well, let's talk about tree ring dating just for a minute here. Tree ring dating is not an exact science. I'll show you. Trees often produce more than one ring a year. I mentioned this in a seminar one time. 
and this guy, here it is right here, access yesterday. Trees will produce more than one, one ring a year occasionally. The extra ring is called a false ring, can be the result of a drought stress in the middle of a growing season. Trees growing great gets two weeks of no rain. It puts out a hard ring. I, a guy came up to me after the seminar one time. He said, Brother Hoven, he's like an 80-year-old man. He said, I carve walking sticks for people. That's my hobby. I like to carve fancy walking sticks, carve their name on it, you know. He said, I raise my own trees. He said, I plant them. Seven years later, I cut them down to make walking sticks. They always have at least 11 rings. Wow. He said, I've been doing this for years. He said, you are right. Those are not annual rings. Generally, they are, and they can be. Jesus. Evidence for multiple ring growth per year in bristlecone pine. Creation.com has a lot of stuff on this topic. Good website. What, what are warm climates that never have a change in weather? Do they, what kind of rings do they produce? It's like palms and stuff don't have rings at all. They have fibers. It's a different type of wood structure. Proof number 27. Oldest tree in the world is 4,300 years old. This is an atheist website claiming that I don't know what I'm talking about. He said right here, It might interest you to know that trees go back at least 8,000 years without being disturbed by Noah's flood. Dr. Ferguson of the University of Arizona, by matching up overlapping tree rings, watch this carefully, of living and dead bristlecone pine, carefully built a tree sequence going back to 6273 B.C., trying to prove the Bible wrong. It turns out such things as rainfall, floods, glacial activity, atmospheric pressure, volcanic activity, even variations in nearby stream flows show up in the rings. We could add disease and excessive activity by pests to the list. There are all sorts of things that can affect the tree ring growth. So if you're going to overlap trees, tree rings, and try to say, well, we can extend the date back, you know, 8,000 years. No, you can't. You can have two trees growing on the opposite side of the same mountain and get different tree ring patterns because when the wind blows up, it drops the rain. When it comes down, it absorbs moisture. You could have two trees growing right next to each other. One gets a couple year head start. It shades the little guy. They have a different ring pattern until the big one dies and now the little one can shoot up. Going right next to each other. Tree ring overlapping, the tree ring date, is a silly way to try to prove anything. General Sherman tree was thought to be five to 6,000 years old. Tests showed only 2,000 rings. This textbook says 4,300-year-old bristlecone pine is Earth's oldest organism. Hmm. Well, that would be the max. The tree's probably younger than that because it, it produces more than one ring a year. Until 19, 2013, the oldest individual tree was the Methuselah tree. 4,800-year-old bristlecone pine in the White Mountains of California. Researchers at the Rocky Mountain Tree Ring Research Group, there's a club for everything, announced the age of another bristlecone pine located in the White Mountains. This one is 5,000 years old. Well, now hold it. First place, it has, may have 5,000 rings. That doesn't mean it's 5,000 years old. So I got a question. If the Earth is millions of years old, why don't we have a tree with 100,000 rings someplace? Why would the oldest tree be, you know, four or 5,000? I have a theory about that. See, about 6,000 years ago, God made everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. Wiped out the world. Now, some trees might have survived the flood. Trees survive floods all the time. A tree could be ripped out by the roots, float around for a few months, and land again and start growing again someplace else. She's been doing that for the last, what, month around here, replanting the trees. So if you find a tree that has more than 4,300 rings, that w it might have started growing before the flood came and survived the flood. Okay? I went to, uh, to Australia with my whole family years ago. To, we saw the Great Barrier Reef off the coast of Australia. My daughter and I scuba diving at the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. Beautiful. Un just phenomenal down there. They studied the growth of the reef, how fast it's growing, and how big it is, and do the math, and they say, this reef is less than 4,200 years old. Okay, I don't have a problem with that, but I have a question. If the Earth is millions of years old, why don't we have a bigger reef someplace? Why would the biggest reef be less than 4,200 years old? I have a theory about that. I believe about 6,000 years ago, God made everything, and 4,400 years ago, there was a flood wrecked the world. 
Now, of course, some coral reefs might have survived the flood and started regrowing again, depending upon all kinds of factors, you know. But I don't have a problem at all with the... I think that's another clue that maybe the Earth is not millions of years old. Hmm. Niagara Falls. This textbook says, The rocky ledge above Niagara Falls, right there, has been eroding for 9,900 years. Really? As the water goes over the edge, it eats, breaks the rocks off, and the waterfall's moving back. They finally had to, they, they shut the waterfall off. They've got a way to shut it off, believe it or not. And then they reinforced the edge with concrete so it would stop eroding the edge because the people that built the hotel by the edge want to keep it there. <laughs> right, there's a little financial incentive there. Niagara Falls history. An area 12,300 years in the making. Niagara, Fa Niagara Falls is a natural wonder. 12,300, where did they get that number? The water through the Whirlpool Rapids below the falls reaches 30 miles an hour. Niagara has moved back seven miles in 12,500 years. I don't think so. 1901, a 63-year-old school teacher, Annie Taylor, went over Niagara Falls in a barrel. I know several folks I'd like to watch do that. Said it's been 12,000 years. Really? Niagara Falls is eroding backwards. All waterfalls do that. Okay. Starts breaking rocks off and erodes. We saw it when we did the dam. Just Google dam break at Dinosaur Adventure Land. Remember we cut the notch in there and it started eroding backwards from the far side. Okay. Here's a, the line show where Niagara Falls was in the 1700s when they first discovered it. People saw that even in the 1600s. Uh, it was the French guy went up there and saw Niagara Falls for the first time. Uh, doesn't matter. Crest lines show the recession of Horseshoe Falls since 1764. It's gone back 865 feet in 185 years. That's 4.7 feet a year. Well, now, wait a minute. Charles um, Lyell, who hated God in the Bible, was a lawyer from Scotland. Somebody figured out if all the lawyers in the world were laid end to end around the equator, we would all be better off. Guy's walking through a cemetery, saw a tombstone, said, here lies a lawyer and a good man. They said, wow, they're putting two people in the same grave. <laughs> Not all lawyers. 99% of the lawyers give the rest of them a bad name. Okay, there are a few good ones. Okay, but Niagara Falls started off here, ended up, or started off up here by the arrow. Now it's back here. Actually, it moved back when the woodcut was made. Now Niagara Falls is way back here, going around this island. There's two Niagara Falls, the Canadian side and the American side, going around the island. They've got a big model of this. I, this is what I want to build for Grand Canyon. I mean, this thing is huge. Three-dimensional model of Niagara Falls at the museum. There, we got to do one for Grand Canyon here out of fiberglass. It's really cool. So Niagara Falls was here in 1841. It's moved back up to here now, going around. There's two falls going around the island. Hold on a minute. It eroded three and a half more miles since 1841. Niagara Falls is less than 4,500 years old, folks. It's moved back a total of seven miles from where the cliff is. My son-in-law that died of cancer, was raised in this city right here. He said, oh, we, we, we see Niagara Falls all the time, right there. Niagara Falls is great evidence Noah's flood happened 4,400 years ago. All that water going over there, it, it's amazing to watch it. This is erosion factor that you wouldn't believe, how fast it erodes that back. This textbook says a gorge above about seven and a half miles long runs just below Niagara Falls. Simple calculation shows it's been 9,900 years. It's not that simple of a calculation, guys. Not if you're coming up with the wrong number. Niagara Falls is here. It's eroded less than eight miles from where it started. If it's moving four and a half feet a year, do the math. That's not millions of years old, that's for sure. The falls are moving south. And like, Why hasn't it gone back to Lake Erie by now and drained the whole lake? 9,900 years? No. Seven and a half miles divided by 4.7 is 8,400 years. But if you start off with a flood, then you got to solve the problem. See, here's my theory. I have a theory about Niagara Falls. 6,000 years ago, God made everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. As the water was running off, about half of that Niagara Falls washed out the first 10 minutes. Since then, it's been eroding 4.7 feet a year. So it looks like 8,000, 9,000 years. Nah, they forgot the flood.
Rock was softer, lots more water, and lots softer rock. Today it's hard, and it's a lot less water. One more and we'll take a break. Today the oceans are 3.6% salt. They're gaining salt every day. All the rivers run in, bring mineral salts, evaporation takes it out, leaves the salts behind. They could have gone from fresh water to 3.6% in less than 5,000 years. Today we have freshwater crocodiles and saltwater crocodiles. They might have had a common ancestor. A crocodile. A peach. A peach. Yeah, why didn't I think of that? You can see the similarity. They're both, both soft except for the... Right. See, changing from a freshwater croc to a saltwater croc is a pretty minor change compared to evolution. They want you to believe it changed from a rock to a croc. Now that would be a major change, okay? I talked to David Clifton from Oak Grove, Alabama, year, 10 years, 15 years ago. He said, I've worked with aquariums all my life. Steve, you've had all kinds of aquariums. He said, I have freshwater fish, black mollies. And I, he said, I had freshwater and saltwater fish. And I got curious, can I mix them together? He slowly added salt to the freshwater aquarium and slowly removed salt from the saltwater. He said after two weeks, he mixed them all together. All of them became saltwater. They adapted to saltwater in two weeks. When he put them back in freshwater, they died in 30 minutes. I don't know if his phone number is still good. I had it on. Eh. I, I think I deleted it because I tried it and it didn't work. So if the oceans are gaining salt every day, why are they only 3.6% salt? Why aren't the oceans saltier? I have a theory about that. About 6,000 years ago, God made everything. 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. The oceans have slowly been gaining salt since the flood. People say, how did Noah bring all that water on board for all the animals? He didn't bring any water on board. They had plenty of water outside. Fresh, fresh, water. fresh water. Probably the whole world was fresh water. Yeah. It's gradually become saltier. There are quite a few more ways from the earth that demonstrate it is not billions of years old. But just like the game Clue, all you got to get is one evidence of a young earth and the case is closed, you evolutionists. Closed. You've got lots of coins in the box that say your theory is wrong. Here's the problem. If it could be demonstrated by any one of these that the earth is only a few thousand years old, your theory is really looking dumb. See, kissing the frog does not turn it to a prince. And waiting billions of years does not turn it to a prince either. Time won't help. But if you don't have time, that will certainly hurt your religion. Your religion's done without lots of time. The billions of years. You take that away and your religion is done. Period. Just that one thing's all we need. One clue. We'll cover more tomorrow night. Different ways to show this earth cannot be billions of years old. And I am fully aware the atheists are going to go nuts over this and you're going to pick at each one of these things and say, Hovind's wrong and here's why. I'm trying to keep up to date on this. I think what you're going to do is probably divert attention instead or ad hominem attacks. You say it takes millions of years for things to petrify. This is proof they had teddy bears millions of years ago. <laughs> Why don't you give it up? Why don't you say, Lord, you made the world. You wrote a book and told us how you did it. I'm sorry for doubting you. Forgive me. Why don't you join the family? Become one of God's children. It's wonderful. We'd be glad to have you. All right, more tomorrow night. Push thumbs up, like us, subscribe, do all that stuff, and see you then. Bye.